everybody can see. I'll minimize that. So what I wanted to talk about today actually is something that goes back a little bit um, to work I had done quite a, a few years ago, uh, but has, has started to become relevant again uh, recently because of work I've been doing with two of the people on the call, uh, Rafael uh, and Deandre Moral, my colleague in Minute University, Department of Maths and Statistics, and Blake, uh, who has recently joined us as a PhD student. And hopefully this will be of interest to all of you, but then it also might be of some benefit and interest to, to Blake and Raphael too. So what I want to talk about are some questions arising in connection with stability and persistence for switched models where the models were switching between our compartmental SIS and these are epidemiological models where we have two categories of people, basically susceptible people and infected people. The good news is that this is not in any way, shape or form an appropriate model for COVID as far as I know. And uh, in fact, it's probably closer to uh, modeling diseases that do not confer immunity in the long run and uh, computer viruses. But there are some interesting mathematical questions that arise and uh, I'll try and get through those in the next 45, 50 minutes or so. Okay, so what's my talk outline first? Um, is my shared window shared, Sergey? It is shared, but uh, it is not... Uh... Uh, it's, it's still it, it's not moving it's still the first page yeah it's still the okay so it's saying bring my shared window to the front mm. how do i do this good question let can me you, can you open the pdf in preview you're on mic i see so is, are we still are we seeing still yeah yeah now, now it's alive Okay, now let now me. It's certainly it. alive. Yeah, now it looks. Yeah. Okay, uh -huh. so it doesn't seem to like full screen. Okay. Mm, okay. So to give you uh, the outline, firstly, I'm going to give some background on stability theory, on switch systems, and on these SIS models. And I'll apologize in advance uh, to to those of you in the audience who may be familiar with a lot of this material, but I just wanted to make sure that we give all the background that we need. Uh, when talking about switched SIS models, there's a concept that's very important known as the maximal Lyapunov exponent in continuous time. And this is a, a continuous time analog of a thing called the joint spectral radius in discrete time, which uh, is important for people who study things like uh, inhomogeneous matrix products and their convergence properties, for example. And I know that there has actually been quite a lot of work done on the joint spectral radius over the max plus and max algebra as well by Alyosha Paperko, for example. So that may be, that may strike a, a chord of familiarity with some of you. And then I want to talk about a switched version of an SIS model with compartments uh, that we started to look at maybe five or six years ago. And to give some results that describe conditions for stability and persistence and the existence of periodic solutions for this switched model. And uh, in particular, I want to focus on some persistence conditions that we can express in terms of the maximal Lyapunov exponent that to my mind anyway, naturally extend some results for the unswitched model to the uh, switched model. But first up, let me move on to the next slide and introduce some notation and terminology. So a lot of this I'll go through quickly because it will be familiar for a, an N by N matrix. I'm going to use rho of A to denote the spectral radius of the matrix A. And I use S of A to denote the spectral abscissa. And what do I mean by that? S of A is just the maximal real part of the eigenvalues of A. So you look at all of the elements lambda in the spectrum of A, you look at their real parts and you take the maximum of all of those real parts. So if S of A is less than zero, all of your eigenvalues are in the open left half plane, for example. A particular type of matrix that's going to be important and will come up a bit later is a Metzler matrix. And this is a non-negative matrix shifted left possibly by a multiple of the identity. So it's a, it's, it's a matrix, all of whose off diagonal elements are bigger than or equal to zero. And you can represent anything that's Metzler as a non-negative matrix minus some multiple of the identity. Um, if I have a finite set M inside in the N by N matrices, then I use conv of M to denote its convex hull. So the set of all 
convex combinations of the elements of M is conv of M. And I will call a matrix A, which is not negative for Metzler, I'll call it irreducible if the digraph associated with the matrix is strongly connected. So what this means is that you can't, by reordering the, um, the entries, you can't, by permutation similarity, transform A into so, a form which is uh, block triangular, okay? Or that the graph associated with it is strongly connected. I'll continue to go down this way. Okay, so let's quickly recap and review some fundamental ideas from dynamical systems and stability theory before I move on to talk about switch systems. So we're going to consider throughout a dynamical system defined on some subset X of Rn. This is our state space. And I'll assume for now that it's given by this equation here, X dot, the derivative with respect to time at any time t is some function f of the state at time t. And we have some initial condition as well, x naught in x. So we would uh, denote by x t x naught, the solution of our system corresponding to the particular initial condition x naught. So this means our solution at time t starting from an initial condition x naught. And I'm going to assume my initial time is zero as well. And I'm also not going to get uh, tied up worrying too much about the technical details of when, I'll have a, when I will have a unique solution to this. So I'm going to assume that F is sufficiently smooth to ensure I have existence and uniqueness of solutions for T in zero infinity so that I can talk about the behavior of these solutions as T goes to infinity. Uh, in the examples I'll see later, uh, built up from the SIS model, my state space X, uh, which would be invariant under the differential equation, is just going to consist of the box where every component is between zero and one, and I will have solutions defined on zero infinity. So when I talk about stability, of course, you always talk about the stability of a particular solution. And initially, we're, we're most interested in the stability of equilibrium solutions. That's a starting point. And an equilibrium for the system is one, it's a solution essentially that stays put where x t starting from x star is just equal to the initial value x star for all t bigger than or equal to zero. And these are characterized as solutions of the equation f of x star equal to zero. So we solve f of x star equal to zero, we get an equilibrium of our system. What do we mean when we talk about stability? Well, uh, there, we're, we're predominantly, I'm interested in asymptotic or exponential stability and asymptotic stability. There's two parts to asymptotic stability of, a, of an equilibrium. Firstly, it has to be stable or stable in the sense of Lyapunov to distinguish it from Lagrange stability. And that is that the equilibrium is stable if I can stay as close as I like to it by starting sufficiently close to it in, in, intuitively. So given any epsilon greater than zero, there's going to be some delta bigger than zero. So it's that provided my initial condition is within delta of X star, then my solution will be within epsilon of X star for all time. So if I want to stay within epsilon, I can do that by starting within delta. And for asymptotic stability, I need two things. I need it to be stable to begin with. So it has to satisfy this condition up here. But then also that I want there to be some capital R bigger than zero, such that if my initial condition is within distance R of my equilibrium X star, then that also means that my solutions converge to X star as T goes to infinity. So this will, I'll say then, if this happens that X star is locally asymptotically stable. So it's stable. And this second condition is what's called attractivity. And if you have both Lyapunov stability with attractivity, you say it's locally asymptotically stable. And if this is actually true for all X star in my state space, then I would say it's globally asymptotically stable. There are a whole host of other subtle variations on this where you start throwing in qualifiers like uniform and global versus local. Uh, for us, this will be enough to get the main ideas across. So in, you know, this again is something from um, an introductory course in dynamical systems. If you want to study the local stability properties of a nonlinear system like this around an equilibrium X star, you can do this by having a look at the linearized system and the linearized system, how do we get that? Well, we look at deviations close to X star and then we study how they behave by calculating the matrix, the Jacobian matrix uh, of F with respect to X evaluated at X star. So this is just the matrix of our partial derivatives, DFI, DXJ evaluated at the equilibrium X star. And this describes locally how small deviations away from the equilibrium are going to behave over time. And if we look at the linear time invariant, meaning that our parameters here don't change with time, 
uh, x dotted t, so d to the t of x is equal to the matrix A, which is this Jacobian up here, um, times x of t. Then this one will have an asymptotically stable equilibrium at zero. And if, if this one has an asymptotically stable equilibrium at zero, then the nonlinear system will have a locally asymptotically stable equilibrium at x star. So to, to sort of characterize uh, local asymptotic stability at some equilibrium x star, we can do that by looking at this linear time invariant system here, which describes how the deviations from x star behave over time. And this system, an LTI system like this, where it's def basically defined by a single matrix A, so the, the rule governing the dynamics is given by A, this will be, I talk now about the system being stable because when I study linear systems like this, I'm really only interested in the stability properties of the equilibrium at the origin. So if I'm talking about nonlinear systems, I really want to talk about which equilibrium I mean, but for the linear system, a bit of an abuse of notation or a bit of a, an abuse of terminology, I'll talk about the stability of the system meaning the stability at the origin. And this will be asymptotically stable if the matrix A is Hurwitz, and that's a term that will come up again later, which means that the spectral abscissa of A is negative. All of the eigenvalues are in the open left half plane. Okay, so that's all uh, linear time invariant systems, which describe the local dynamics around an equilibrium of a nonlinear system. And things can get more interesting even with linear systems if we have multiple modes of operation and we can switch between those. And this arises in, in engineering and it's, you know, a simple prototype typical example might be a car with multiple gears where you have one set of dynamics, uh, which uh, one set of dynamical laws when you're in first gear, and then you might change the second gear and the laws are different. And then you might change third gear and the laws are different again. And the changes can sometimes be abrupt. This can also arise in control theory where you might have different controllers depending on the uh, circumstances, the, the atmosphere around you. And you might switch between those controllers uh, depending on what you want at a particular time or where you happen to be in the state space at that time. So this is sort of the, some motivation for studying switch systems. And these have been the subject of intensive study in engineering and applied maths now for over 20 years. And if we started with a, a family of nonlinear systems defined by vector fields, F1, F2, out to Fm, and then we switch between them, how might we describe this system? Well, we could write it in this form where X dot is given by F subscript sigma T of X where sigma t will always be something uh, in the set one to m. So sigma t is essentially picking out which particular constituent system is active at each time t. But I may not know this law in, or I may want to study the behaviors, the possible behaviors of this system over all possible switching signals or rules. You could also think of this if you wanted to, to a slightly more general or mathematically sophisticated model as a differential inclusion. But here I'm going to consider a slightly simplified view of what these switching signals might be. I'm not going to consider arbitrary measurable functions. And instead I'm actually going to consider switching signals that are piecewise constant and continuous from the right. So in a practical sense, what this means is you start off at time zero and then until such time as you hit some, the next moment at which there's an abrupt change, which we'll call T1, you follow uh, your dynamics is governed by one system, the system that works from T0 up to, but not including T1. You then take the initial condition at T1, which is just the, the limiting value as you approach T1. And from that, you follow the dynamics uh, given by whatever system is active between T1 and T2. And uh, sigma T will be constant on these intervals, TK to TK plus one uh, for K equal to zero, one, two, et cetera. Okay. So essentially we're following gear one for a certain amount of time, then we switch, we follow gear two, then we switch, we follow gear three and so on. Why these become interesting is number one, they're, they're practically important in a lot of engineering and other applications, but also mathematically they can show behavior that you cannot see in the constituent systems that make up the switch system. So loosely speaking, you, you find a couple of things can happen if you have linear systems and you're switching between individually stable linear systems, then you can find, and under some circumstances, you can find switching signals that will lead to instability. So you can switch between uh, modes where each individual mode is perfectly stable and everything will converge back to the origin. And if you pick a, a, if you pick a, a bad switching signal or a bad way of switching between the systems, your solutions can blow up. 
And on the conver conversely, you can also sometimes start with unstable linear systems. And by choosing an appropriate switching signal, you can switch between them and drive your solutions to the, to the origin. So you can actually stabilize unstable systems by switching in the right way. Uh, to think about this, essentially, because with linear systems, your solutions are always given by e to the at, so they're matrix exponentials times your initial condition. What you're looking at here is uh, basically we're saying that you can take two matrices, each of which have spectral radius less than one, and multiply them together to get a matrix with spectral radius bigger than one. That's what you're saying in the first case. And in the second case, you're saying that sometimes you can find a way of taking matrices, each of which has spectral radius bigger than one, and you can multiply them in an appropriate way and get something which has spectral radius less than one. Okay, so with these observations under our belt, a couple of the key problems that people have considered for switch linear and switch nonlinear systems, and the, the ideas behind these will come in again when I talk about the switch SIS systems uh, models in a couple of slides time. Uh, one of them is, well, given a family of switch of individually stable systems, can you determine conditions that guarantee the stability of the origin for linear systems, for example, under arbitrary switching? So I would like to know that no matter how somebody decides to change gears, that my system still behaves well. In the second qu uh, question, uh, what are we looking to do here? Uh, you might be given a collection of unstable constituent systems, and then you would want you want to identify uh, switching signals which stabilize. So a, a way of switching between these unstable individual systems that results in in a stable behavior. And then in the third one, you might actually want to be able to identify ways of destabilizing a stable constituent system. And you'd want to avoid these typically, right? So you'd want conditions that tell you, okay, if you follow this particular switching law, even though your individual constituent systems are stable, you will end up uh, with an unstable system. And actually this third question is one that I'll come back to later or a variant on this for epidemiological models. So, in a couple of slides time, I'll start to talk about this <clears throat> maximal Lyapunov exponent for um, switched linear systems and switched SIS models. And when we come to talk about persistence for them, I'll relate that to the existence of certain types of matrices in the convex hull of a set of matrices. So first I want to talk a little bit about how convexity and stability for switched linear systems actually relate to each other. So let's start by thinking of a switched linear system and it's defined by a set of matrices. And if the switched linear system is stable under arbitrary switching, then this actually implies that the convex hull of the matrices, the set of matrices M can only contain Herbert's matrices. So if I have a system X dot T is A sigma T X T and the A sigma T is switching between these matrices A1 up to AM, and if this is going to be stable for any, any arbitrary sigma, then any matrix in the convex hull of M has to be Hurwitz. And converse, a sort of converse, is that if the convex hull of a set of matrices M contains a Hurwitz matrix, so if there's something stable inside in that convex hull, then there has to exist a stabilizing switching signal. So, this gives you a sufficient condition for the, existing, the existence of stabilizing switching signals, that if you had a set of matrices, each of which defined an unstable system, and that you could find some convex combination of them, which was stable or Hurwitz, then there's some switching signal, some way of switching between the systems, which actually results in a, in a stable time varying system. So this is a, a simple example, maybe just to illustrate one of the results on the last slide, if you were switching between x dot equals a1x and x dot equals a2x here, um, each of these is Hurwitz. They are, this one is lower triangular, the eigenvalues are minus one, minus one, so all of the eigenvalues in the open left half plane, minus a half, minus three quarters, all of the eigenvalues in the open left half plane. But if you look at the convex combination, a half a1 plus a half a2, you can actually show very simply that this is not going to be Hurwitz which means that these, the switch linear system associated with these isn't going to be stable under arbitrary switching. Right, so that is my, my detour 
introduction through stability theory and uh, switched linear systems and some of the ideas and problems that come up when we start to switch between um, autonomous systems. Uh, next, I will talk about a compartmental model uh, in epidemiology that was introduced in this paper in 2007 by Fall and co-authors. And it's a, a generalization or an extension of the, of, a ver, of the very simple SIS model where you just have a single population consisting of susceptibles and infectives. Here, what they did was they divide the population into N groups and then within each group, you have susceptibles and infectives. So SI is the number of susceptibles in group I, II is the number of infectives in group I. And we let NI denote the total population in group I. And we're going to allow for a birth and death rate equal to each other within group I, and that's mu I. And beta IJ is just going to describe the, the rate of transmission between group J and group I. You can see what this means more precisely on the next slide. And gamma I is the recovery rate for group I. So it's if you're in group I, this characterizes how quickly people who catch the disease tend to recover and then go back to being susceptible again. So the time invariant uh, SIS model that they wrote down is given by these, these equations here. And of course, this is one less than or equal to I, less than or equal to N. So the rate of change of the susceptibles in group I, well, this term here, these are the births and they join into the susceptible class. So all of these parameters, the mu i and the gamma i are per capita on the last slide. So births join the susceptible class and that's another way of putting that is they say there's no vertical transmission. These are the deaths from the susceptible class. And then this term here, captures the transfer of people from the susceptible group in, in susceptible class in group I into the infective class in group I. And if you look at the term, uh, the IJT over NJ is like the probability of somebody being infective in group J. And then this whole term is capturing like an expected number of contacts between uh, susceptibles in group I and infectives in group J. And then beta IJ is capturing the fraction of those that actually result in the transmission. And then the gamma ii of t, these are the cured individuals coming back from the infective group and rejoining the susceptible group. And we have a corresponding equation for the number of infectives. Again, these are the transfers into the infectives in group i. And this term here is the gamma i, our, the contribution is from those who are cured and go back to being susceptible. And the mu i is the deaths occur occurring in the, the infective individuals in group i. And if we take a look at SI dot plus II dot, it's an easy exercise to show that the population size of each group NI is constant for each group. And what that allows us to do, or allowed them to do, is to essentially eliminate one equation because SI is always going to be given by I, NI minus II. And then they study this, this variable instead, the XIT given by the fraction of group I that is infected at time T. And if we do a very, very simple piece of algebraic manipulation and just go back to the last equations, you find that you can write down the, uh, the following differential equation for xi, and it gives you that xi dot t is equal to 1 minus xi of t times this sum from j equals 1 to n beta i j x j of t, and then minus alpha i x i t, where the beta i j's are the same as on the last slide, and the alpha i's are the gamma i plus mu i. And alpha i will be strictly positive, and the beta i j's are all bigger than or equal to zero. So if we write this in matrix form, we have uh, the one gives us a matrix B times the vector x, minus a diagonal matrix times the vector x. And then we have a nonlinear term here, which is essentially the diagonal matrix formed from the components of x times B applied to x. And that's this equation here. So x now written as a vector, we have x dot is minus this diagonal matrix plus b minus the diagonal matrix form from the entries of x times the matrix b, all times the vector x. And d is a diagonal matrix of positive entries down the diagonal and b is non-negative. And if we go back, it's probably easier in fact to see it from the form with the, co the coordinates on the last slide but it's not too hard to show that the set of all x in Rn plus, the non-negative vectors, 
where each component xi is less than or equal to one, this is going to be invariant. So we're really studying this, this system of differential equations on um, the box where all of the xi's are between zero and one. And also the origin is in equilibrium for this. Um, you can see that directly from the form here. And this is called the disease-free equilibrium or DFE for short. So the results that they prove for their model um, um, are as follows. They firstly assume that the matrix B is irreducible. We talked about what that meant on the first slide. Essentially, the uh, digraph associated with B is strongly connected. And under the assumption that B is irreducible, then the origin, the disease-free equilibrium at the origin, is globally asymptotically stable, meaning that it's asymptotically stable and everything uh, converges to the equilibrium at the origin, everything in the state space X, which is this box um, with everything between zero and one. And this uh, equilibrium, the disease-free equilibrium is globally asymptotically stable if and only if this parameter R0 is less than or equal to one, where R0 is the spectral radius of D inverse times B. So this is just a non-negative matrix. And by playing around with, with properties of non-negative matrices, you can show that this R0 less than or equal to one condition is equivalent to the spectral abscissa of minus D plus B being less than or equal to zero. And this minus D plus B is essentially the linearization. It's the Jacobian of this right-hand side evaluated at the origin. So we have a condition for asymptotic stability of the disease-free equilibrium in terms of the spectral abscissa of this matrix minus D plus B. And a second result they proved, which we'll also look at generalizing to switched systems in a while, is again under the assumption that B is irreducible, um, there will exist a unique endemic equilibrium by which we mean a steady state or an equilibrium for our uh, system, which is inside where all of the components are positive. And this is true if and only if R0 is greater than one. So if R0 is less than or equal to one, everything goes to zero. And if R0 is greater than one, then you have an endemic equilibrium and only one. And in this case, the endemic equilibrium is asymptotically stable and it attracts everything in the state space we're looking at apart from obviously the equilibrium at zero. And again, this condition that R0 is greater than one is equivalent to the spectral abscissa of the linearization minus D plus B being positive. Okay, so this I won't go on, won't, won't dwell too much on, but this is really just what, this is what we started to look at a few years back uh, where we thought of a switched version of this model. So we have, instead of a single diagonal matrix and a single non-negative matrix, let's assume instead that we have a finite number of diagonals and a finite number of non-negative matrices. And then we look at the switched model, x dot equals minus d sub sigma t plus b sub sigma t minus diagonal x b sub sigma t x. So we're really just switching between the individual vector fields defined by each pair d1, b1, d2, b2. And this sigma is again one of these switching signals that's piecewise constant and continuous from the right. And one thing that I just note that if I do actually get to talk through an argument or a proof later on might come in and be helpful, is that no matter what switching signal you pick, once you fix one, then the resulting system is going to be order preserving, meaning that if I start with initial conditions x0 and y0, where x0 is entry-wise less than or equal to y0, then the solution at time t starting from x0 corresponding to the switching signal sigma will be entry-wise less than or equal to the solution at time t starting from y0 corresponding to the same switching signal. So the ordering of the initial conditions is going to be preserved uh, as the solution evolves. So if we linearized our switch system, essentially, we just look at the linearization of each individual system at the disease-free equilibrium at the origin, we get a switch linear system, x dot uh, equals minus d sub sigma t plus b sub sigma t of x. And you know, each of these matrices, minus D1 plus B1 up to minus Dm plus Bm, they're all going to be Metzler because the Bs are the only non-negative contributions are going to come from the non-negative, the, the, non, the only off-diagonal contributions are going to come from the non-negative matrices B1 up to Bm. So all of our system matrices are Metzler. And what we looked at, look at, at investigating first was to replace the spectral abscissa 
of minus D plus B, where we only have a single matrix to worry about with the maximal Lyapunov exponent of the set of matrices here, M. So from now on, the M is going to refer to this set of matrices associated with my switched uh, SIS model. So what do I mean by the maximal Lyapunov exponent? Um, without going, going into the details of this here, it, at, we can think of time evolution operators uh, corresponding to a switch signal sigma as giving uh, as describing how we map from our initial condition up to the state at time t. And because we are, if we're switching between linear systems to begin with, the solution of each linear system is just an, a matrix exponential. So really these time evolution operators that bring you up to time t will just be products of different matrix exponentials for the, for the setting that we have. Or they're also given as solutions of this matrix differential equation here, but it might be easier to just think of them as products of matrix exponentials corresponding to which matrix was active in each interval. And then for each time t, we're going to let h subscript t denote the set of all possible time evolution operators for time t. So this is over all possible switching laws that you might have had to bring you up to time t. So every possible operator that could take you from your initial condition up to your state of time t over all possible switching signals that you could have chosen. And then you consider the operator semigroup, which is the union of all of these um, sets ht as t goes for t over t bigger than or equal to zero, where we set the one at time zero to be just the identity. So at time t, what do we study? We, we first consider uh, for every one of these time evolution operators, that these products of matrix exponentials up to time t, we look at the norm of that, where this is any induced matrix norm. And then we take the logarithm of that and divide it by t. And then we look at the supremum of these numbers here over all possible time evolution operators up to time t. So what's this telling us? Well, if you think about this lambda tm, it's like a, an upper bound. It's the least upper bound of all of these numbers. And these are the logarithm of the norm of phi to the one over t. So e to the lambda tm acts like uh, an upper bound for the norm of phi to the one over, uh, one over t. And you can then see easily enough that e to the t times lambda tm is giving you the least upper bound of all of the norms of phi. So this lambda t of m is characterizing a worst case exponential growth rate at time t. It's, 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 it's the worst, it's the fastest your solutions could be growing at time t. And then if you look at the limit and you can prove that this is indeed a limit as t goes to infinity of lambda t of m, then this thing is called the maximal Lyapunov exponent associated with our switched linear system. And this thing is a natural enough generalization of the spectral abscissa for a single system of to the switch system. And it, it's essentially a logarithm of what's called the joint spectral radius, uh, which was introduced for discrete systems by Rota and Strang back in the 60s. And then a version, uh, what at first looked like a different notion called the generalized spectral radius uh, was studied in the early 90s by Ingrid Dobeshi and John Lagarius. And a lot of work has been done on this by people like Nikita Barabanov, Raphael Jungers, Fabian Wirth, and, and many, many others as well. But I'm thinking of it as being uh, a natural generalization to a switch linear system of the idea of a spectral abscissa for a single matrix. And it's characterizing exponential growth rate, worst case exponential growth rate for my switched linear system. So now I get to talk about some results. Um, if we make the assumption that the convex hull of our linearized, the, the matrices, the minus D1 plus B1 minus D2 plus B2 and so on, if we assume that that convex hull contains an irreducible matrix, so I'm not assuming they're all irreducible, just that there's some convex combination of them that's an irreducible matrix. Under that assumption, then the disease-free equilibrium of our switched model is going to be globally asymptotically stable if 
the uh, maximal Lyapunov exponent is less than or equal to zero. So if you think back for the single system case, what Fall and co-authors had shown was if the matrix B is irreducible, then the disease-free equilibrium was uh, asymptot globally asymptotically stable if the spectral system was less than or equal to zero. And this directly generalizes that using this maximal Lyapunov exponent. Proving it when the maximal Lyapunov exponent is strictly less than zero is actually very straightforward because from the form of the nonlinear system, the SIS nonlinear system, its solutions will be dominated by the solutions of the linear system, and they are all going to go to zero once this condition holds. So the nonlinear one will also converge to zero. All of its solutions will converge to zero. It's trickier. The, the really difficult, the, all of the work here is on the boundary case, actually, to show that this also holds when the spec the maximal Lyapunov exponent is equal to zero. And that relied on a theorem Fabian Wirth proved about the existence of what are called extremal norms. But that would take us a bit far away from where I want to go. So I'll just move on. So that gave us an extension uh, of Fall and company's results for um, asymptotic stability of the disease-free equilibrium to the switched case. And it uh, is a pretty much natural extension and guarantees stability of the disease-free equilibrium under arbitrary switching. And what I want to do now is to talk about the other side of the coin where the maximal Lyapunov exponent is bigger than zero. And what can we conclude? So for switch systems, it is possible to ask about endemic equilibria, but it's a little bit it's a little bit messy because you are switching between many many different potentially multiple systems and what exactly you do how you define an equilibrium you need to be kind of careful, and instead what I want to talk about is a, a concept known as persistence, um, which, from the point of view of an SIS model. What this will capture for us is that the, the number of infectives in the population is there, it persists and it's positive in the long term. So this is a sort of opposite behavior to the disease-free equilibrium being stable. And at this stage in, in mathematical ecology and the use of dynamical systems in epidemiology and ecology, there's quite a, an extensive literature on this notion of persistence. If anyone is interested, you'll find very good general references uh, in a book by uh, Hofbauer and Sigmund, and also a more recent one by the AMS by Hal Smith and Horst Thieme. And there are many, many other contributors, and my list here is not in any way complete or exhaustive. Sebastian Schreiber should be mentioned, Michel Benayim, uh, Zhao, and I, I think Schreiber and Benayim tend to focus on these for stochastic systems and stochastic switching as well. Okay. What's the intuitive idea behind persistence and dynamics and persistence for a dynamical system is that we have some measure uh, of the overall population, something that we're taking out from it, which might be the number of infect, the total number of infectives, or it might be the maximum number of infectives across all of our uh, groups. And we, we want this to remain positive in the long run. So that, that, that's the idea we have in our mind. And what can vary, of course, is what we mean by in the long run, how, in, how strict we are about positivity and what the measure is. So I'll introduce a couple of definitions and then get through some results. Um, firstly, I'll talk about weak persistence. So we have, again, for now, we have a, a system which is not switching. We'll come back to switching in a couple of slides. X dot equals FX. And we start from X naught and our state space is capital X. And I'm assuming I have a mapping which takes me from my state space into the non-negative real numbers. And this is my, my measure of the overall population that I mentioned on the last slide. And we say our system is weakly eta persistent with respect to this mapping if this condition here holds. So what is this saying? This is saying that if I start from an initial condition where this measure is positive, where eta of x naught is positive, then the limb sup as t goes to infinity of the measure along the solution is positive. So this limb sup is some positive number, which may, we call it epsilon, but it may depend and typically will depend here on x naught. So there's some positive epsilon with the property that no matter how far out I go in the solution, 
somewhere after that time, my measure is again bigger than epsilon. So this is a sort of a weak condition. It's saying that if I start from an X naught where the measure is positive, then there is some epsilon associated with that X naught, such that no matter how far along I go, sometime later, again, my measure will be bigger than epsilon. If I want to talk about uniform weak persistence, it still involves this limb sub. So we're still saying that no matter how far out I go, at some time later, I'm going to be bigger than epsilon. But for uniform weak persistence, the epsilon does not depend on the X naught. So here, this, this limb sub as T goes to infinity always has to be some positive number, but that positive number will depend on X naught. Here, it has to be bigger than some positive number, which is independent of X naught for uniformity. If I replace the limb sub with the limb inf, then I get notions of strong persistence and uniform strong persistence. And the intuitive idea for strong persistence is rather than saying, no matter how far out I go, there's gonna be some time later where my measure is bigger than epsilon. Here, what you're actually saying is that if I go out far enough, everything after it is bigger than epsilon. So this is a stronger condition because you're expressing it in terms of a limb inf. It's saying, if you go out far enough, then every for every time after that, the, the value of the measure along the solution is going to be bigger than the epsilon, which in the first case may depend on X naught and for uniformity, it, it is independent of X naught. So this is a stronger uh, condition than the last one. So that's persistence for an individual system where we just have one vector field. And if we're switching between them, um, as, we will, as we were looking at for the epidemiological model we had, um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about the existence of weakly persistent signals and uniformly weakly persistent signals and corresponding notions for strong. And essentially all we're saying here is that there is a switching signal sigma, which once I pick it, um, I, I satisfy for the system defined by that switching signal sigma, I'm going to satisfy the condition for weak persistence, meaning that eta of x naught bigger than zero, the measure at x naught is bigger than zero, will imply that the limb sop as t goes to infinity of eta along the solution uh, corresponding to the initial condition of x naught and this switching signal sigma is positive. Then we call that sigma a weakly persistent switching signal. And if we have a switching signal uh, sigma uh, and a fixed epsilon such that if eta of x naught is bigger than zero, then I know that this limb sop along my solution corresponding to sigma from the initial condition x naught is bigger than epsilon, where this epsilon again now must be independent of the initial condition x naught, then this is a uniformly weakly persistent switching signal. And if I carry over the, the definitions of strong and uniform strong persistence, I can define notions of strongly persistent signals and uniformly strongly persistent signals as well. So I'm going to, coming up, well, we've still a little bit of time. Um, so I'll talk about some results that we've gotten around these and the existence of these uh, signals. So first, we're going to talk about the switch SIS model from uh, a few slides ago. And we make a, str a stronger assumption than we did when proving stability of the disease-free equilibrium under arbitrary switching. Uh, here we assume that every matrix BI uh, and remember our linearized system was minus di plus bi for one less than or equal to i less than or equal to m. So we assume that all of these matrices are irreducible and we assume that there is some matrix R inside in the convex hull of our linearized, the matrices corresponding to the linearized systems with the property that this matrix R has some eigenvalue with the, a strictly positive real part, that its spectral abscissa is greater than zero. Uh, and if you think about what we said about uh, switched linear systems, if I have an R in this convex hull, which is not Hurwitz, which is what this is saying, then the linear system corresponding, switched linear system corresponding to M cannot be stable under arbitrary switching. So this is a, a stronger condition than assuming that my switched linear system is not stable under arbitrary switching. I'm assuming there's a con an, an R in the convex hull of M which is not Herbert's. And under these conditions, I could conclude that there is some epsilon greater than zero and some switching signal 
such that no matter what initial condition I pick, which is entry-wise bigger than or equal to zero and not equal to zero. So as long as I have some non-zero component in X naught, then for all I, one less than or equal to I less than or equal to N, the lim inf as T goes to infinity of the ith component of X along my solution corresponding to sigma is bigger than epsilon. So this is actually quite a strong um, conclusion when we have this, these two things happen, that the BIs are all irreducible and that there is some matrix in the convex hull with the spectral abscissa bigger than zero. For example, this would immediately allow me to conclude uh, uniform strong persistence for the infinity norm, right? Because if the infinity norm of X naught is bigger than zero, then certainly it's going to satisfy this condition here. And then I, and the conclusion I'd have is that the lim inf as T goes to infinity of each component is bigger than epsilon. So certainly the lim inf as T goes to infinity of the infinity norm would be bigger than epsilon. And in fact, it allows you conclude uniform strong persistence or the existence of a uniformly strongly persistent switching signal for any of your standard norms. It should, it'll work for the L1 norm, the L2 norm as well. Okay. And also, you know, you, you can, of course, pick, you could pick eta of X to just be the, the number in component I. So if eta of X was just X sub I, you'd also have a uh, uniform strong persistence with respect to that eta. So it's persisting in each compartment or group. I don't want to, to dabble too much into the proof of this at this stage, because we are come, we're gone past 10 to. Um, the, the idea is actually quite simple uh, in itself. And then it's just a question of working through the technicalities. And the idea is you, you take the convex combination that gives you this matrix R, which is not Hurwitz. And of course, these coefficients, kappa one up to kappa n, they're all going to be between zero and one, and they'll sum up to one. Uh, and you look at a, a time invariant system, which you define using those coefficients. So you get a matrix D hat and a matrix B hat, which is just given by the convex combinations of the DIs and the BIs. And under the assumptions of the theorem, you can ap apply the result of Fall and company to conclude that there is uh, an endemic equilibrium for this time invariant system, uh, which has an asymptotic, which is asymptotically stable and attracts everything. And in fact, you can conclude more than that. You can conclude that there's a vector V, which is entry-wise positive, which if I start from that vector V and follow the solution along, follow the solution of this system, then the solution I get will be monotonically increasing. You then uh, construct a switching signal using your um, using these coefficients kappa one up to kappa m. So you pick a time interval zero to capital T, and you follow uh, system one for the first kappa one fraction of the interval. Then you switch to system two for kappa two to system three for kappa three, and so on, and you reduce T until such time as the switching system that you're following will be very, very closely approximating the system, the time invariant system uh, that we talked about in the last slide. And by playing around with some results from the averaging theory of ODEs, you can conclude the, the, the result of the theorem. Okay, and we can actually get more on the same hypotheses. In fact, under the same hypothesis as on the last slide, you can actually prove that there exists a switching signal and some positive initial conditions such that the resulting solution will be periodic inside in the uh, interior of the orthant. Okay, so I'm coming up on the end, so I do want to get to the very, very last result. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll just summarize the, the, the situation before putting it up. And that is to say, well, what do we know? We know that if our uh, set M <laughs> it contains, uh, is such that the convex hull of its matrices is, contains an irreducible matrix and the, uh, the maximal Lyapunov exponent of the, the set of matrices, the linearized systems is less than or equal to zero, then the disease for equilibrium is globally asymptotically stable under arbitrary switching, the disease dies out. And we know that if each BI is, is irreducible, and that's of course a stronger assumption than this, and there's some R in the convex hull of our matrices whose spectral abscissa is positive, then we get this very strong form, uh, as a switching signal that gives us a very strong form of persistence. 
And this is certainly if SR is bigger than zero for some R in here, then we can conclude that the maximal Lyapunov exponent of the set of matrices is positive. But the other direction is not true. It's, it's perfectly possible for <clears throat> the, the maximal Lyapunov exponent of a set of matrices to be positive, but for everything in the convex hull to be Hurwitz. There are examples known for this. So there's a gap between the two conditions. And I'll skip over the two by two case and just give you the, the main result, which came out about 2016. And again, we're talking about the switched SIS model. And we assume each matrix BI is irreducible. And then if the maximal Lyapunov exponent is positive, then there will exist a switching signal that's uniformly weakly persistent with respect to the, the measure eta given by the, the infinity norm, the max over i of the absolute value of xi. So for switch, the switched SIS models of any dimension, once we have an irreducible bi, each of the bi's is irreducible, we know that if the maximum Lyapunov exponent is less than or equal to zero, the disease-free equilibrium is globally asymptotically stable under arbitrary switching. And if the maximum Lyapunov exponent is positive, then there is some uniformly weakly persistent switching signal. I won't go through the proof of that because that definitely would go over time, but there's a lot of natural questions that come out of this. Uh, there's quite a few gaps left. So <clears throat> our result gives us uniform weak persistence with respect to the infinity norm. Is it possible to conclude uniform strong persistence? We got a very, very strong form of persistence with the condition based on the convex hull. Um, is it possible to relax this uh, assumption that all of the B matrices are irreducible with a slightly weaker one? Uh, this one, I think, is something that uh, is certainly worth looking at. I mean, extending it to other ecological models like uh, nonlinear matrix models, for example, in discrete time. And also, does our condition about the maximal Lyapunov exponent being positive, can we conclude from that the existence of a periodic solution? So at that point, I think I will stop. And um, I can, I'll leave, I'll continue to screen share, Sergey, will I? You can, of course, um, because uh, there, there may be questions from the audience, which uh, I'll now uh, invite the audience to ask. So uh, are there any questions to the speaker? <clears throat> 